Hello, everybody. This is the fourth inspirational webinar in uh, supply chain optimization. We are very happy that we have been able to share uh, all three others already with you in the past. They have been uh, broadcasted in the past two months, and they were about inventory optimization, uh, where we have Bob Woodburn of uh, Papyrus in our webinar. It was on IBP, sales and operations planning, and there was one on uh, network design in combination with cost to serve. I think this webinar is also really interesting because it's not just about production scheduling, but doing that in a really precise way, fitting exactly your way of production scheduling. And on top of that, we have a great guest in our midst, being Paul Coombe. Paul is the supply chain director of NAMPAC Glass. I will introduce NAMPAC Glass in a few seconds, but I'm really delighted that Paul is in the webinar. He'll be sharing with us, by way of an interview, his experience with production scheduling. In his particular case, it was actually about how to do the production scheduling in a really interactive way, so that you not only make the best possible use of your production facilities, but also are able to respond in the best possible way to changes in demand. Paul has a wonderful experience in that. He has 16 years of experience in NAMPAC in various senior supply chain and general management positions. We will talk to him somewhere halfway this half hour webinar. And the company he works for, NAMPAC, NAMPAC Glass is a particular division of them. It's Africa's leading packaging company with a very large glass production facility in Rodekop in South Africa. Glass production, as you can see on the picture, it's about glass bottles, small bottles, big bottles for wine, beer, and any other kind of liquid. Uh, they serve major companies, ones that we are very familiar with, like Heineken, but also more unknown, at least to us companies. His particular uh, challenge that he will share his experience and the steps that he made with us are about tactical and operational production planning and scheduling. And within NAMPAC that is particularly challenging. If you look at the whole production process of glass bottles, it starts with a huge furnace of molten sand, basically, where color or some other additives are being added and being molten into a fluid that's about 1500 centigrade of temperature. That furnace is really huge. It's like a small church, really big. And there's three main outlets of that furnace, and from these furnaces, you go into a number of outlets where molten glass goes into the actual molds to create the bottles or the other glass objects. What you can imagine is that every bottle has its own uh, characteristics in how fast you can inject the glass into it, how much glass goes in there, how quickly it can change from one bottle to the next. So basically, every glass bottle has its own characteristic on how much glass will flow into the mold if you're producing that bottle. There lies the intricacy, the difficulty in this scheduling process, because added together, all the 12 sections times the three outlets, the total draw, the total production from the should be as close as possible to 350 tons per day. If you get bigger, the quality of the glass will deteriorate. If you go below, basically the same happens, plus you just reduce the utilization of what is a really expensive asset. So there you have a very difficult interaction and interdependency between the different production batches, uh, and you still have your demand uh, that you want to meet so that's, in their case, the complexity of their production schedule. Well, adding to that that they actually have three furnaces uh, makes the whole process even more difficult. And if you then also add to that that if you want to change glass color, like from green to amber or to transparent glass, you have to completely empty a furnace and fill it up with a new mix. Uh, which takes a couple of days. So that's not something you typically like to do uh, really frequently. So that just adds to the complexity. As you will see later on, I'll give a few other examples of production scheduling. This scheduling is really different from other production scheduling activities. 
my background, I have a background in supply chain network design, mechanical engineering, operations research, worked about 15 years in, uh, in business with logistic service providers in retail, and about six years in supply chain and manufacturing consulting, and now for about three years with Ames. And I must say, I really enjoy working here. It's, it's wonderful to see how a flexible and a, a modeling environment, a modeling software technology can help in situations where people either, yeah, either just accept that there's no solution or resort to working with uh, spreadsheets. And working in Ames is just, as you can see from our promise, we can solve basically any critical business problem uh, in about four months with, with our breakthrough technology. There's just so many examples where we see that happening, like also with, with NAMPAC Glass, but also with major other companies where in a really short time a critical business problem was solved in a way that planners who normally did their work in another way now could work with brand new AIMS application and that they like to work with it. Part of that power of development is in the core of AIMS, which is a powerful optimization core, which forms the foundation of any AIMS application. Uh, and what that does is in any situation, any planning situation that you have, you can depict all the difficulties, all the aspects that you need to take into account in your planning or scheduling process and that powerful optimization engine then always finds you the best set of actions or in this case the best possible production schedule. And it's not necessarily one production schedule, it can be a series of production schedules like one being the most cost effective or the delivering the highest revenue or the most profit and you can compare them and choose the one you like best, as you will see at the example in the end. By the way, we will show also an example of an AIMS application uh, at the end. The AIMS application developed for NAMPAC class for Paul Coombe, and that demonstration will be given by Districon, uh, by Eric Hoving, and I will introduce him later on when he starts giving his demonstration. Right now, I will just show you a few little examples with production scheduling to give you a feel, if you're not so much familiar with production scheduling, why it actually is pretty complicated to make a production schedule. And let's first start with a very simple demo. It's actually just a production plan, a number of activities that need to be planned. Uh, if you just randomly put them here, they will take about 180 minutes or so to produce them all. If you move from one production, like in this case white, to another, uh, in this case red, there's an intermediate time, a changeover time of two hours. If you go from white to black, it's four hours, or to golden, it's five hours. So the uh, changeover time depends on the order of uh, the different products. And what you need to do in this simple example is just try to put and it is really simple. Just put every order in, in the production line and try to do it in the smartest possible way. And I just now put them in there to, to see, okay, so how can we produce them? Well, we get to 176 minutes. And it's not two or 176 hours. Well, let's try to reduce that a little bit. Oh, this is just a little bit shorter. Maybe if I put this one here. Well, it, I'm now at 165 minutes. Maybe I can improve a little bit more. But you see, it's, it's playing and playing, and you might get better and better. But if you press optimize, the system will just plonk within 0.4 seconds, put them in the optimal order, which gets you well, in this case, about 8.5% shorter than what I could do in about one minute. And you can say, well, hey, if you do this more often, you will get used to it and you will be able to get pretty close to the eight, eight and a half or to the optimal schedule. But that's just one example. Now let's try to make it a bit more complicated. Say, well, we've got a job shop. Here you see the routing on the bottom right. There are six different uh, ways of producing a product, etching first, and then cutting, laminating, and then testing, and here you can see all different orders. And per product type, there's a different 
way of producing it. This is a simplified version of, of a production plan for a high-tech company where you have etching and gold plating, lamination, drilling of the holes and then the, the, the fitting of the electrical equipment. So these are the orders, all the tasks that need to be planned, 53 in total. So it's a bit bigger, just add all different orders. What you will see is that it will get a pretty long list of the total production schedule. And if you then try to reduce the order of producing them, you can imagine that might become pretty complicated. Well, let's try to, for example, put this one here. Okay, that can start in the beginning, but the end time is still at 20, 2100 uh, minutes. So maybe I can put this one more to the front as well. Okay, it reduces now. I'm now back at about 2086. Uh, maybe I can reduce further, put this one here. Yeah, that's even better. Well, you can imagine if I play around with this and I get some experience with it that it actually, I might get to 17, maybe even 1600 seconds, but it's already pretty complicated and it takes me quite some time and now the automated schedule has done it. Okay, so that's 1100 hours. So I tried manually to 1700 and automated, it's down to 1100. And there's visually, you can also see this is my plan and this is the optimized plan. It's much denser. And this is with only 53 orders, six different production types. So you can imagine more production and more orders. It, it just becomes impossible to do it by hand. And if you can, you lose a lot of money in the process because you don't do it in an optimal way. These kind of complexities you find just in all sorts of industries, pharmaceutical industry, in the packaging industry like NAMPAC, chemical, food. The high-tech company is basically, this is an example of a production scheduling for a real high-tech company for Hitelab in uh, Hungary. Um, you can see at this scale, you really need advanced technology to help you optimize this and to respond to changes. It's just a bigger version of the second example that I gave. This is an example for Sanofi. In the pharmaceutical industry, it's even more complicated because of the longer lead times in production. The active ingredients might take weeks to really get to the level that you need it. Then it needs to be verified by a laboratory. Then the actual grade of activity will be determined of the active ingredient, which determines the final way of producing the final blend in your end product. And there's a number of intermediate stages where you not only need to clean your equipment, but just where intermediate product need to be verified, quality control by the lab before you can go to next stages. Uh, and you can see that by a range of parallel lines that are all interdependent. Really complicated and just fundamentally different from uh, the other types of production scheduling that we saw. This is again different in the chemical industry where it's quite often focused on readiness and maximizing utilization of the technical equipment. And readiness as in that your whole production line with voles and pipes and silos and everything in between needs to be ready for a production. Then the run will start, but after it's stopped, it needs to be cleaned really quickly. If you leave it in maybe for an hour uh, before cleaning, then the equipment will deteriorate or maybe you even need to take it out completely because the product has hardened or has done something else and anyway has damaged your your infrastructure. So that's that's a typical thing in the chemical industry, but not only chemical. I recently spoke with somebody in the food industry making sauces, and they have the exact same situation where moving from one source to the other, they need to steam clean the whole installation. But then again, you only have two or three steam cleaners. So when to do the changeover from one to another, given the restriction in steam cleaners. That's typical what you find well, in chemical, but also in some food production. So having said that, given all the diversity, as I said, just when I said joining AIMS, what I really like is 
it, it's wonderful to see how with AIMS you can just wrap your technology around the complexity that you have and always get to a good, easy to use, workable solution. And that's why uh, I'm also delighted that Paul Coombe is in this webinar. I will switch on Paul's microphone right now. Welcoming you, Paul, because I'm really looking forward to hear from you what your view is on on, on production scheduling and why it is important for you and for NAMPAC Glass. Uh, good evening, or well, good afternoon, actually, Marcel, and hello to everybody who's joined in the webinar. Thanks so much for inviting us to, to participate, and I think it's a really good story that we can tell, because we're a business that is trying to make more of a name for ourselves in the South African glass market, and, you know, coming from a base of being a smaller business, your systems aren't that sophisticated. You tend to rely very much on, on gut feel and personality, and then as you grow and you get bigger, there's a responsibility to become more efficient and you find yourself unable to do that just because of the nature of the systems and the way in which you've, you've conducted business in the past. And, and there's no better way of, of illustrating that than in our production scheduling process. It was very much based on Excel and in fact it was quite fixed. It was not a dynamic process in the sense that it was impossible for somebody to model things and create scenarios and look at optimization opportunities. So certainly for us in our business, having recently acquired a new furnace that's increased our capacity by 50%, we've created a lot more complexity, a lot more SKUs, a lot more sales. But ultimately, the process of production scheduling could not be sustained under the old way of doing things. So for us, it was absolutely a burning platform. I mean, every business wants to achieve the sort of optimal mix of the right customer service and the smallest logistics cost and inventory carrying cost. But certainly, production scheduling in our environment is the defining point at which we achieve that successfully or very unsuccessfully. And maybe just to illustrate the little point that along the line of what you were illustrating to everybody earlier, myself, is the glass making business is, 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 a, is a process, obviously a process based business. Our furnace runs every day of the year, 24 hours a day, unless we schedule downtime. And that type of a downtime, once every 10 years you rebuild the furnace, but within the time frame of day one to the end of year 10, the only legitimate downtime other than production efficiency and that would be the changeover that you do, either a process change or a job change. Now, a process change would be a type of a, a production process that you need to change, and that can take up to two or three days in some cases. A color change, as you mentioned, can take up to seven days. And then the simplest form of change is just a simple two bottles that look the same, where you leave the same, what we call, um, blanks and you just simply change the molds. And that can change, take up to two to three hours. So in our kind of a business, being a process-based business, we really sell time. You know, our business is premised on having furnaces that output a certain amount of tons of glass every day. And we've got to maximize the amount of tons that we draw off those furnaces every day. And as you've sort of illustrated, those changes that I was talking about um, impact upon our ability to deliver optimal tons out of our furnace. And what you tend to develop in that situation is a natural tendency to avoid these changes because everyone knows they're costly. Everybody knows that they're not the right thing to be doing. So what you tend to do is you tend to say, well, you know, let's just not do them. And, and let's rather build stock, you know, create some inventory, avoid the job changes. There's no particular science behind what the correct economic order quantity is around is it more efficient to in fact incur some of these changes than hold the stock and deal with the risk that goes with stock. I'll talk to it later about some of the complicating factors, but certainly there are some complicating factors in our environment around holding stock for too long. So I guess the, 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 the gist of why production scheduling is important is the fact that a business that is growing is proliferating SKUs is dealing with the whole issue around inventory, safety stock creep, I suppose you'd call it. And essentially that 
debate in a glass environment occurs in the production schedule. And the complication really in the production schedule is that if you've, as you tried to illustrate earlier, if you've got a furnace that's got three lines, and on, on the line one, you've got a, let's say, 185 gram beer bottle, and on line two, you've got a 250 gram very light wine bottle, let's say. To get the optimal draw, you have to have a 450 gram bottle in that third line. And, you know, if you don't have a sale for it, then you're going to be putting it into stock and hoping you're going to sell it. So the complication is that you have to operate your draw within a very defined range and band. And so what tends to happen is you run what you think you can sell to achieve the optimal draw. So production scheduling has to be able to occur at a tactical level to plan the furnace for the next week, but it's also providing that decision-making point for sales a few months down the line when we say, well, we're going to be changing color, we're going to be running a different color, and we've got some nice beer bottles on this line, now you guys must go and find some wine bottles, some nice heavy wine bottles on the other line to balance the draw. So, truthfully, the, 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 the production schedule is not a tactical operational tool. It's very much part of our SNOP process. It rolls up to say, sales guys, you know, we, we're not going to achieve our draw, and very definitely draw equals profit in this business, um, unless we actually achieve a line balancing approach. So production scheduling for us is absolutely critical in those, in those spheres. The, the complexities, just very quickly, highly seasonal products. We, we do color campaigns, so there's a natural element of stock build if you're running, let's say, a dark green bottle twice a year. You're building stock for up to six months. Um, absolutely, you do need to schedule it sensibly if you're going to be building stock for the next six months when you're out of color. Um, you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is in certain of our bottles, let's take a flint bottle, I'll give you an example. In, in the areas that we store our bottles, high temperature variability, quite, I mean, today it's 39 degrees, we haven't had rain for two months. We get a product called Bloom, which is a discoloration of the glass. That occurs when you store up to four or five months, you can start getting Bloom. Now you can add, you can do what they call puffing of Freon grass. You can add that, but that just adds cost. You know, if you can get the production scheduling right, the planning right, you don't need to anticipate holding it for longer than, longer than six months. And, yeah. and then, of course, you don't have the cost that goes with it. So, um, you know, the, 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 the reality is quite simply that a glass business is a long-term planning horizon. Um, so there are elements of production scheduling that will inform the long-term planning horizon. Another very simple example will be glass is formed out of silica, sand, and colored. So colored is a more efficient, colored is broken glass that you recycle. That's a more efficient, energy efficient um, commodity. But you don't need to collect colored um, in the same proportions if your color campaigns are different. But at the same time, you can't simply switch off with these. We in our country, we have these hawkers that, that go around on these little informal collectors, I suppose you call them, that go around and collect bottles to recycle for our colored. You can't switch them off one month and switch them on the next month. So you need to determine a price and a strategy to keep them collecting, even when you don't need the stock, knowing that in six months' time, you're going to need a certain requirement. So yeah. absolutely, the, the, the schedule in our business informs a whole lot of quite senior decisions that affect the, the, the long-term profitability of our business. Um, I don't know, I hope that gives everybody a flavor without getting into too much detail of just quite how complicated it is and how the production schedule, although it really is regarded quite at a junior level, I suppose you'd say, in fact really does inform a lot of our, 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 our longer-term strategic drivers. I like really what you said, Paul, and what in particular struck me is how you said that production scheduling is really essential and elemental to your sales and operations planning process. I noticed that in many companies it is positioned somewhere deep down in supply, far away from any business planning, and it's really good to see how you lift it up and say, well, hey, it's actually essential to how successful we can be as a company, as a business, and not just it's not just about efficiency and getting the most out of the assets, it's very determining to how successful you can be as a company. 
Absolutely, and and I think you know many of our customers, like over, overseas, are proliferating their SKUs as much as 20% a year, and a, a SKU proliferation in our environment might be an embossing change on a bottle or whatever. And unless you actually look at it at the scheduling level, you don't really come to visible terms with how things are changing in your business and the and the nature of the impact of these changes. Um, you know, if you if you roll everything up, you, you don't have the, the the right quality of debate. So certainly our SNOP meetings are, are very much um, centered around some of the detail within this schedule. And, and when we talk about the planning technology, it's only when you have a system that is visible where you can actually articulate things in a detailed level that don't bore people or don't take executives starting to do their emails. Um, you've got to be able to condense it. You've got to be able to represent the detail in a, in a, in a very nice, clear way. Then we can have a detailed discussion because they can see things moving and things happening and the impact on cost. And I guess that certainly talks to the, the, the point around planning technology because an old sort of um, manual system, you could certainly never be able to present your arguments as, as efficiently. So that's actually what you Is see as like added that? value for of, of planning technology in your organization, that you are able to really have the right discussion discussion with the right people Absolutely. yeah okay um, and certainly okay. in terms of, of, of us having having been part of a business where we didn't have um, integrated planning technology when I say integrated planning technology I'm talking to the fact that we've got a demand system, demand management system called the mantra which probably you're all familiar with which talks directly to um, the, the, the production scheduling tool the gobs tool and in fact that's the starting point of everything so you know, we have a, a forecasting tool that talks to a planning tool. And essentially with the information we now have available to us, we can get a much more visible picture of the business much more quickly. Previously, we were quite unable to um, change the view from a monthly view to a daily view and a weekly view without a lot of hard work. It just simply is impossible to model the number of iterations and the muddle. The, the, it's a muddle. That's a, that's a good word, word for for putting it in, but the, the number of potential outcomes, um, yep. you know, it is just far too Im impossible is, is the only, only way I can describe it. And what we can now do is instead of having a static view for a month and sort of talking around it and, and saying, well we'll, well, we'll input these changes at the end of the next week or at the end of the next month, we can actually input them live, model them live. We can take decisions without waiting for a meeting in a week's time immediately. And for example, today we made a decision to extend our one of our color campaigns. We were originally going to go to Flint, which is the clear glass in December. We made a decision um, to, to keep going in emerald green, which is the Heineken beer bottle color. And we were able to make that decision and get the ND to approve it on the basis of within a very, very short period of time being able to see what's the impact on all of the customers, what's the impact on the days when we're going to be doing changeovers. In other words, is there a changeover on Christmas Day? And we were able to model all the things that were of interest to the business to get to a point of decision in front of everybody live. Of course, wow. to get to that That's point, yeah. we've had to go through yeah. quite, quite a lot of internal strife around our, net, our network response time on our wide area networks. They've, and, and Eric will be able to tell you, they've added eight CPUs. You know, at any points in time, we're using uh, memory in excess of 10 gigs. So certainly. The bit that you probably don't know is that we've had to have some pain to get to this point that we can actually um, be efficient. But now that I think we're quite efficient, we're certainly seeing the, the, the benefit of it. Um, more real-time information, certainly being able to take away the emotional attachments that people have to certain bottles and to certain customers. Without a doubt, a lot of our decision was emotional attachment stuff. Now we're able to actually talk in the detail, talk in the numbers, talk in the facts, and we were able to quite clearly articulate this beloved customer is in fact not contributing to the profit of our business as much as perhaps somebody else that's um, less favorably appreciated, if I can say it like that. Yeah. And um, you know, we can get decision making a lot more quickly. And there's no doubt that as our customers are, are changing, we're having to change and be more nimble. I think without the ability to have a, a, a planning technology platform, we certainly would not be able to be as nimble as, as what the market necessitates that we are. And for us, it's certainly proven to be 
dream. Yes, super Paul. Thank you. Thank you. I think you made it really very tangible as to how 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 this planning technology helps you in your in your daily decision making in be becoming really in control of the decisions that you make and the impact uh, that they have. I really want to thank you. I'll thank you later on, but thank you right now for, for your contribution. So I would like now to move forward to a, sh a short demo of the actual application that you are using by Eric Hoving of Istricon, and he will show the application. Hello, Please everyone. Sir. Thank you, Marcel and, and Paul, explaining the complication of the production scheduling environment at NAMPA. And I've visualized some of the things Paul just mentioned, like for example, a daily SNOP meeting where there is just confirmed by sales that the demand for a certain bottle, uh, let's say the bottle I just selected, increased, uh, which you can see in the lower part of the screen. And th that increase in demand means that the current production run uh, is not enough to cover all demand. If uh, we it's considered as outside capacity, and we want to prevent that, so uh, we can uh, extend the job, and we would like to immediately uh, shift all other job and jobs according to the new end date, which I can do uh, as I show over here. And well, I I'm just want to add another job which I prepared for demonstration purposes, which will be included on line 14. And now select again uh, this bottle, and you can see that there is no longer a demand which can't be met. But on the other hand, there are still other bottles which are outside capacity. So what we would like is to use optimization to suggest the best set of actions uh, to really uh, bring our uh, profit to the next level. Because on the right below of the screen, you can already see that uh, net cash flow. Uh, already improved by our manual interaction, so that is already the benefit of modeling and a visual platform. But now optimization really brings your uh, business to the next level, and and that's what we can do in the create schedule space where optimization uh, in several scenarios is uh, possible. So also for long term, uh, up to two years. It's possible, but I will now focus on a shorter horizon of 13 weeks, uh, where we again see our adjusted uh, plan. And what I would like to do is get the current job on line 15. I would like that fixed. But on the other hand, everything might be optimized uh, within the current color campaigns. So I don't uh, want to allow uh, other colors to change. It's possible as well to use optimal campaigns, uh, but we don't do that for now. And we run all five optimization scenarios which are defined together with the customer. So if I push optimization, uh, I get the uh, default scenario back in, in the Gantt chart. And you can immediately see that the bottle 540 is not, uh, not longer on line 14, but its uh, a second job is scheduled a few weeks from now. And that means that the bottles in between are preferred to, to be produced as well, uh, because otherwise that demand is lost. And in a different overview, we can see uh, uh, the production and the stock uh, in, a, in a stacked graph. Uh, and similar to the pre uh, previous one, uh, on a monthly level, we can see that there is no longer uh, outside capacity. And what I would like to also, also show you is the bottle 416, which was out of stock earlier on, uh, really soon. And now it's only out of stock at the end. And that's because we only optimized the three month horizon. And, and on, the, on the right the bottom of the screen, we can see that the net cash flow really increased. So as I mentioned, this really uh, brings your business to the next level. The data in here is anonymized for reasons of confidentiality. So it's fictitious data which you see in the screen. And all other scenarios which we run uh, while I push the optimization button, I can compare those in the compare scenario view. And if I select only the scenarios based on the current color campaign, uh, I can uh, easily see in this chart that the max profit scenario is best in terms of profit and also good in the amount not sold, and that uh, means the outside capacity. But I can also change and see other KPIs on the axis, like for example revenue, 
but you also see the background uh, uh, changes uh, accordingly. And again, the max profit scenario is, is the best one to choose. And from here, you can uh, select this scenario as the, as the new scenario, and you can, again, use manual interaction, uh, which I started uh, my demonstration. So I think this really explains uh, some of the, the challenges Paul mentioned in the daily business of NAMPAC in a short demonstration. So I would like to give uh, the word back to, uh, to Marcel. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Eric. I think you showed in a really short way that uh, you can actually almost grab your production schedule, play with it, say, okay, what if uh, I change this? What if I change? And that's already one part, but you can even ask smarter questions like, show me the, the possible uh, schedule or the best possible schedule if I want to maximize my profit or show me the best possible schedule if I want to minimize lost sale, or show me. And that's actually yeah, the next step in, in, in planning and making the life of a planner, and, and in this case, your whole business planning easier. And it, it creates all, all the evidence and the facts that Paul Kuhnt was talking about that really helps now the conversation between supply and, and demand between production and sales. Uh, because you've got all the facts and consequences and, and, and all the good options uh, on the table and you can have a fact-based discussion around that. You're thank, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Eric. We go towards the end of the webinar now, just inviting you, if you say, well, hey, this is interesting, I like the AIMS approach, uh, just as a matter of fact, know that if you think, well, hey, can this also work on top of uh, SAP, for example, of Oracle, of we've got APO, can we work? In, Yes, uh, this is meant to be drawing data from well, other systems where you have your orders, your master data, your product data, and feed also the production schedule back to it to keep the rest of the organization informed. Uh, so it's really about interacting and building on top of other systems. If you like to experience how what, or what AIMS can do for you, we offer a two-day workshop together with Districtcom where you actually where we focus on the problem that you have, and at the end of the two days workshop, you will see already an example application built exactly around your specific situation, including the impact on product, on price, on project, how to do this, and wh when it should be ready uh, for you to start working with. It's a really w wonderful workshop to do. I like to participate and, and be part of it, and uh, <laughs> so do our clients. This is the end of this workshop. I would like to thank again Paul Coombe of NAMPAC for joining us. I would like to thank Eric Hoving of Districtcom for joining us and sharing the NAMPAC example. There's one thing I would like to point out to you uh, is that Optasoft, the partner who built the two applications, the games that I showed in the beginning, actually have developed a website www.productionplanning.eu. It's really interesting uh, background material on the phenomenon of production scheduling and uh, I hope to see and hear you next time again in uh, a new series uh, webinars either follow up on these subject, subjects or new subjects on the use of optimization in the field of supply chain and with this we close off thank you bye bye